Okay, hello everyone and welcome to the Great Lakes Seminar Series. Uh, my name is Greg Dick, I'm the director of Sigler and I'm pleased to introduce today's speaker, Bill Curry. Bill is uh, a professor in the School for Environment and Sustainability at the University of Michigan. He got his BS in Physics from Brown, his Master's in Environmental Science from the University of Virginia, and his PhD in Natural Resources from the University of New Hampshire. He then went on to do a postdoc at the Marine Biological Laboratory in Woods Hole. Um, like I said, Bill's a professor in SEAS. Uh, my notes here said previously served as academic associate dean in SEAS and, and currently serves as the associate dean for research and engagement at SEAS. And there he actually plays some really important roles in interactions with, with Sigler. So he, for example, oversees and facilitates the hiring of our research scientists, our, our PIs, and also uh, helps us out in uh, the investments that SEAS makes in Sigler in the form of cost share. So really important roles that we really greatly appreciate. Uh, Bill uh, is an elected fellow of the AAAS, and he is currently the co-director of the Sh uh, Schmidt Artificial Intelligence in Science Postdoctoral Research Program at U of M. This is housed in MIDAS, the Michigan Institute for Data Science, and this reflects Bill's interest in sort of big data modeling artificial intelligence. So Bill is an ecosystem ecologist. A lot of his work focuses on biogeochemistry, especially the cycling of carbon and nutrients in many different systems, but uh, importantly for today's talk, the, the biogeochemistry of nutrients and, and the role of plants in that in coastal ecosystems and wetlands. That's what we're gonna hear about here today. Plant community dynamics linked to ecosystem biogeochemistry in Great Lakes coastal wetlands, modeling for both basic understanding and management applications. So please join me in welcoming Bill. Do I need to hit, hit, okay. Okay, we should be all set. Oh, thanks, Greg. Thanks everyone, it's great to be here. Uh, great to see you all. I'm looking forward to uh, meeting more of you and, and seeing more of the place um, after the talk. I want to start by gratefully acknowledging funding from NASA, um, the EPA, and the Michigan DNR. The work I'm going to talk about today has taken place over a period of about 12 years with a lot of collaborators, um, worked with folks at Michigan State, Michigan Tech, and um, there's actually seven universities listed here. Some of these are people who did postdocs here at Michigan and then went on to faculty positions at other universities. Um, you'll notice that I don't have any collaborators here from Sigler and um, I'm hoping, one of the reasons I wanted to come and give a talk today, I'm hoping to um, maybe jog some ideas and some thinking and, and conversations with people later, thinking about things we could potentially collaborate on because I think you'll see there are, um, there are a lot of opportunities um, um, for that. So I'm going to start with an overarching question about environment and sustainability. I teach a class on sustainability issues in the Great Lakes region, and, and I start with this question. We're in a race. Can we understand and protect ecosystems and the functioning of the Earth system while also growing the economy before we degrade ecosystems and the Earth system so much that it harms future generations? So first, sustainability science is not about stopping economic growth. It's about enabling economic growth while figuring out how to protect ecosystems and the functioning of the Earth system. Um, to do that, I think I don't have to convince the people in this room, we need to understand ecosystems and Earth system function. So this photo is um, part of the Earth system that I and many of you or all of you are, um, are working to understand better, both from basic science perspective and to protect it for today and for future generations. So I'm a modeler and modeling the Earth system function and ecosystem function is really what got me interested in environmental science in the first place. I came from physics, I worked in aerospace engineering for a while and I was doing modeling and the thought that you could apply this to ecosystems and the Earth system is, is really what we got, got me interested in this field. So the research I'm gonna talk about today is in coastal wetlands on a really fine scale on this image. You know, coastal wetlands at individual spots along the coastline at various parts of this image. Um, so I studied that dynamics in one small spot with, with this model that I'm gonna talk about. But the goal is to build new knowledge that can scale up. I'll talk a little bit about how we're doing that. We're starting to do that, but there's a lot more that can be done. Um, I'll also talk a little bit about the complexity and systemness of ecosystems um, 
as complex adaptive systems because they don't always act in linear ways or expected ways and that's something that we need to understand as well. So today I'll talk about the a uh, little bit more about the motivation for the research. I'll introduce you to this model, the Mondrian model of wetland community ecosystem interactions. Talk about plant competition and invasion, how the model is designed and some results. Talk about some biogeochemistry in the model design and results. Uh, some work we've done to apply it to management questions um, and uh, scaling up, which I just mentioned. Um, and I put a little thought into some potential use by folks at Sigler or collaborations with Sigler. So I'll, I'll finish by um, uh, proposing some ideas there. So when we started this work um, 12 years ago or more now, uh, this idea that differentially elevated nutrient flows, specifically nitrogen, um, from the land drive wetland plant invasions around Great Lakes coastlines. Okay, so we have on the left, you can see what a negative uh, marsh community looks like. Um, and then the other two photos are invasive cattails and invasive phragmites. Um, you can see a big difference, right? The plants are really small stature in the native community and they grow very large and very dense um, with these invaders. There was thinking that these invasions tend to occur in places where the nutrient inflows are high um, and you have differentially elevated nutrient inflows around coastlines. I think this is really well accepted now, but when we first started doing this research, this was kind of a kind of a question, and that's one of the things we wanted to address. The wetlands in the Great Lakes, um, and by the way, there are historically a lot of wetlands in the Great Lakes. Um, I think most of you are probably familiar with this, so I'm not gonna digress um, too much into this. A lot of them have been drained for agriculture, but there, there are many that remain. They were historically oligotrophic because the Great Lakes were historically oligotrophic. Um, and this is what a, what a wetland looks like, a Great Lakes coastal wetland that's oligotrophic. You can see there's a lot of bare sediment between the plants. The plants are not competing for light. They're competing for nutrients. They're also not competing for water because it's a wetland. They're really competing for nutrients. And when you provide elevated nutrients, it completely shifts the ecology of the system. One of the things I'm addressing with this model that uh, that I'm really excited about is the biotic hierarchy, this idea that was um, proposed uh, and made popular by E.P. Odom, ecologists in the 1970s. Individuals compete with one another um, and make up a population. Populations compete with one another and make up a community. And then when you take a community and add energy flows, um, carbon cycling and uh, nutrient cycling, you get the ecosystem and then the ecosystem can be used to tile different parts of the earth system. Part of the sort of a holy grail for ecosystem modeling is to include all those levels of organization in one model. And that's what we've tried to do with this Mondrian model and something, something I'm really excited about. So this is not a new idea. This is a paper that's over 30 years old. Um, so Mondrian is an individual based model. It models each individual plant, okay? Uh, the idea of individual based models was that you could try to synthesize and unify ecological theory. You could study populations, communities, and ecosystems in the same model if you have an individual based model. The idea is, so each one of these um, little circles here represents an individual and they're spatially explicit. They're, they're, they have a location in space. The environment can be heterogeneous. So this individual can be experiencing a different environment from this individual, both the abiotic environment, like nutrient levels and light, um, and competition from its neighbors, competition for light, competition for nutrients from its neighbor. So this individual is surrounded by different neighbors than this individual, right? Each individual has its own um, characteristics. These different size circles here represent different sizes, right? So each individual has its own attributes. It's distinct from all others. It has certain species. It has a certain size, has a certain root to shoot ratio, whatever. Um, and individuals compete with one another um, in sort of a uh, ecological neighborhood um, that's, that varies heterogeneously in space, right? And if you can aggregate over this whole space, you can get ecosystem level phenomena. Um, so like I said, this is not a new idea, uh, but it's something that modelers try to, try to replicate and something we've tried to do with this model. So we started out with some basic science and applied science motivations with this model. From a basic science perspective, can we integrate fine scale processes in a model so it produces emergent community and ecosystem level phenomena? So you're not 
coding how the ecosystem works. You're coding how plants interact, right? And how they compete for nutrients and how they compete for light and so on. And you hope that the ecosystem emerges in the model. Um, exploring interactions among plant communities, nutrient cycling, um, and also the hydro period and the water flow rate uh, is a big part of this model as well. Exploring feedbacks in ecosystems as complex adaptive systems. And you hope that you can learn something about invasion ecology or community and ecosystem ecology generally by doing these kinds of, of models. That's, that's kind of the basic science hope, is that models sort of codify our understanding and they help us examine and test our understanding. And we hope to learn something um, from the model itself. Then there were a lot of applied questions that motivated this work as well. And over time, we tended to focus more and more on these applied questions. Um, what's the role of nitrogen inflows in facilitating plant invasions? Um, ecosystem nitrogen and phosphorus retention. This is a really important function that coastal, coastal wetlands perform in the Great Lakes, retaining nitrogen and phosphorus from getting into the lakes. Um, management actions and adaptive management to control invasive species um, is another thing that we've, we've used this model for. So basic and applied um, questions. So that's uh, sort of the motivation. I'm gonna move on to talk about um, some basic things about how the model works and then move on to plants and biogeochemistry. So it's a spatially explicit model and individual base that models each individual plant. Uh, it can be 10,000 um, plants in a square meter um, and it operates at a really small square, small scale. About a square meter is, is would be a big scale for this model. Sometimes we do a quarter of a square meter and we test you know, whether we get different results in a quarter of a square meter and one square meter. We don't, and that gives us confidence that we can model a, a fairly small area um, and, and we're, we're getting something representative of that scale. So that area is divided into grid cells. Um, each grid cell has a different um, nutrient level. So there's heterogeneity, there's spatial heterogeneity even within one square meter. So the plants that are in each grid cell are experiencing a different, um, different nutrient level. There's spatially explicit plant competition. There's clonal architecture and clonal reproduction. These plants are clonal. They're connected together below ground. Um, they can reproduce clonally and there's architecture like branching. I'll talk more about that in a second. Each of these little grid cells, um, they're like 10 by 10 centimeters. Each of them has a complete ecosystem model operating in that little grid cell, right? Um, and I'll talk uh, more about that as well. And there's water that comes in, there's water that goes out, it carries nutrients in, carries nutrients out. So to talk a little bit about um, the individual plant physiology, this is really in some ways at the center of the model because like I said, we tried to build it by coding how individuals work and then sort of going up the hierarchy from there uh, um, you know, with the emergence uh, by putting a lot of individuals in the same space. So competition below, you've got uh, below ground rhizome and above ground ramets. Okay, so competition for nitrogen and phosphorus um, takes place below ground. A lot of what I'm gonna talk about today focuses on nitrogen because we just added phosphorus to the model. We go to NASA grant a few years ago to add phosphorus to it. Um, that work is now complete. It's fully tested, it's ready to go. We're working on some papers, um, but uh, we don't have a lot published yet, so much of the stuff, most of the stuff I'm going to show you that's results is all going to have just nitrogen. So the, this below ground rhizome competes for nitrogen and phosphorus and then produces the shoot. The shoot fixes carbon and translocates it back down to this rhizome. Um, this parent wants to create a new daughter rhizome, so it has to have enough carbon, nitrogen and phosphorus to create the new daughter. The new daughter can then start competing for nitrogen and phosphorus and when it gets enough, plus enough carbon subsidy from its parents, it can can produce a new shoot. Um, so these individuals are um, connected together below ground and all of these translocations take place in the model in a spatially explicit way. The model knows every parent, every daughter, how they're connected, right? Who needs nitrogen? Who needs phosphorus? Um, uh, it's really kind of cool to model how the daughters sort of ask for resources and the parents should like, yeah, I don't have enough today, come back tomorrow. Um, and, uh, there's branching as well, which makes it even more complex in the coding of this, but, uh, but really sort of fun to work with. So there's a plant physiological source sink model um, at the level of indiv individual plants and at the level of clones. Some strengths of this model are that 
it does population processes, it does community processes, and it also does ecosystem level processes. There's a complete carbon, nitrogen, and phosphorus cycle in the model. Um, and you can get these cross-level feedbacks on dynamics over four levels of organization, which was one of the really interesting and exciting goals, and, and the model is actually doing that really well. Um, it's a complex model. It's, it might be the most complex ecosystem model I know of. I don't really say that with pride, um, but it's, it is what it is. And to get a new grant funded, you could almost always have to add something to it, or you get a new graduate student who wants to study some new question, and they want to add something to it. And, um, the large number of collaborators were just constantly adding new things. Um, the model has uh, over 250 parameters the user can change. One of, the, one of our guiding philosophies in making the model was that wherever you need a parameter in an equation, don't hardwire it in the model, make it a variable and put it in an input file, right? It's something like uh, the root to shoot ratio of, of a particular species or something, right? Or if um, there's a light extinction curve, as light penetrates down through the canopy, there's a quadratic equation that has two parameters. Rather than just hardwire those in the model, we put them in an input file. That doesn't mean you need to think about all these parameters or think about changing all these parameters, right? It's just, it gives you complete flexibility that there are a lot of changes you could make um, to explore new kinds of questions that we haven't even thought of just by changing things in the input file. But a lot of people look at this big long input file and get a little intimidated. Like I have to measure 250 parameters? No, you don't. There's default values and a lot of those are things you, you would never change. Um, but anyway, um, typically the way we use this model is we'll, we'll, we'll do thousands of runs, like 5,000 to about 20,000 model runs. Typically we, have a, we use a factorial combination of drivers and parameters and we wanna uh, explore a variety of questions. Um, and a strength of this model is that you can simulate things you could never do in nature, like turn off light competition. <laughs> what happens, you know, what happens if nitrogen and phosphorus come in and an invader tries to come in and you've turned off light competition? Do you get the same thing with light competition on? Um, it actually turns out that that larger plants do better even when you turn light competition off, which is which is really kind of interesting. And I'm not sure we really understand why that happens. Um, but that's a lot, that's kind of the fun thing you can do with a model like this. And part of my philosophy um, in building this was to, to put in switches like that. As you're coding the model, you add switches that can be turned on and off. So just kind of to explore theoretical questions that you could never do in nature. It prints out about a hundred different model results each in a time series. So uh, a lot of information about this plant species. Um, and like I said, a full carbon, nitrogen, and phosphorus cycle. So Lots of data get printed out each in a time series, and then we port that to a database for analysis. And we often have, you know, 10,000 model runs that we port to a database for analysis. We've done some field sampling, um, really that we use to sort of um, gather information on plant parameters. We have eight coastal wetland sites around, around Michigan. And um, this is me, and this is actually me here too. I like I like to say this is a photo of a modeler outside of his natural habitat. <laughs> All right, so let me talk about uh, plant competition and invasion with the model, then biogeochemistry, and then we'll move on to management. So I'm gonna walk you through five or six model results. I've got them numbered just so to make it easy, um, you know, when we're talking about key model result. Um, one of the earliest results is from a 2014 paper was insight into invasive mechanisms of competition. What you're looking at here is on the x-axis is time. Um, the filled circles here are an attempted invasion. Uh, this is uh, typha cattails attempting to invade. Um, and these are, uh, this is a, a native species here. And the, the y-axis is NPP, net primary productivity. A lot of the graphs I'm gonna show you have NPP on the y-axis and you're looking at natives versus invasives. At low nitrogen inflows, the invader arrives, tries to get established, and really can't. An intermediate nitrogen inflow, the invader becomes part of the native community but doesn't completely take over. And at a higher nitrogen inflow, over a time scale of 15 or 20 years, the invader completely takes over and um, the natives are completely extirpated. So this was a success, an early success for the model because this is what we thought was happening in nature. And um, like I said, we didn't code this into the model. What we coded was the biogeochemistry and the plant 
interactions, and this sort of emerged from the model. So this was a really exciting early success. Um, at high enough nitrogen availability, the invader is always able to invade the native community, and the larger size is turns out to be really key, uh, which we learned a little bit something about um, ecology, plant competition ecology, and just published a paper on, on size and plant competition coming out of that result. So what we're looking at here, this is a, another model result, a little bit different. Um, what you're looking at here is not a time series. Each symbol represents the end of the model run, okay? So we, we first populate the model with a native species. We allow an invader to try to come in, um, and then we simulate 30, 35, or 40 years usually, right? So you take that endpoint at 40 years, and each symbol here is an endpoint from one model run, okay? So we have varying nitrogen inflow here, but the nitrogen inflow is constant through a model run. It's just we did one run where it was nine and another run where it was 22 or something, okay? Um, and you look at the endpoint here, and we're looking at the invader NPP proportion going from zero to one. So one is where the invader has completely taken over. We see this really interesting threshold effect. And this is part of the systemness and nonlinearity that I was talking about. We expect from ecosystems because they're complex adaptive systems. Nice to see this, this interesting result in the model. Um, you get this threshold effect. You get to a certain nitrogen inflow, and then you just increase a little bit, and, you, and the invasion completely takes off. Um, another interesting thing that's a model result is how this is mediated by the hydroperiod or the water level. If the muck is anaerobic, it slows down nitrogen cycling. So it takes a little more nitrogen to get to that threshold. If the muck is aerobic, the water, water level is a little lower and the muck is aerobic, it speeds nitrogen cycling and that threshold takes place a little faster. A really interesting interaction between uh, the water level and the nitrogen cycle and the invasion. To test some of these interactions, uh, uh, we did this field study where we built some mesocosms. So these are cattle tanks. They're, they're tanks farmers use to give water to their cattle. They're about two meters across. Um, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> we installed about 100 of these, 50 at the University of Michigan Biological Station and 50 at the Edwin S. George Reserve. The water comes in, um, it picks up some fertilizer, um, nitrogen and phosphorus, and then it goes down to the bottom and percolates up and drains out. So the water level is always kept right at the, at the top of the muck. And we bury these so that it would uh, moderate the temperature um, so that it wouldn't get too hot or too cold. We wanted to test this hypothesis that a pre-existing native community would inhibit invasion of cattails, particularly at low nitrogen inflow, because that's what was happening in the model. At low nitrogen inflow, the invader can't invade. Um, in the model, if it tries to, in, tries to colonize bare sediment, it does just fine. But if there's a native community there, it can't. Right? The native community uh, um, offers something we call biotic, biotic resistance to the invasion, but only at low nitrogen. If the nitrogen is high enough, the invader invades regardless, even if there's a native community there. We wanted to test that, so, so that was the design of uh, this experiment. We grew the natives for one full year, and we planted three different cattail species, um, and uh, we had two vegetation treatments, one with bare sediment and one with uh, natives. We had 12 different nitrogen inflow levels. And after um, four years, we harvested these. And um, this is hot off the presses. We're, we're just working on a paper now on these results. So just a photo showing you what happens when you have the invader in bare sediment, it does just fine. But in a pre-existing native community, you know, we planted this invader there and three years later, it has not really reproduced very much and not really grown very much because of the biotic resistance. So these are some results from these mesocosms. At, um, you're looking at um, the cattail biomass trying to invade bare sediment. It does just fine. These are increasing uh, levels of nitrogen inflow into these mesocosms. Um, we had a little bit of phosphorus input, but we only varied the nitrogen input. It does just fine and increasingly with more nitrogen, but when the um, natives are there, it's not able to grow at all. Um, at one site, the Edwin S. George Reserve, uh, there was complete inhibition by the biotic community, the pre-existing natives, 
um, at the bio station at high enough nitrogen, this is the hypothesis we were trying to test, at high enough nitrogen, um, the invader was able to um, invade, while at low nitrogen it wasn't, and in the bare sediment it was. So um, this biotic resistance decreased with the nitrogen inflow at one site, but not at the other site. And we're, we're still trying to figure out why at one site and why not at the other. A little bit of a non sequitur here, just showing you kind of the range of the things that, that we can do with this model. Since it's a spatially explicit model, um, and it knows where we plan is and how they're all connected, one of the things we print out is all of this spatial information, right? And I had a student a few years ago who was interested in trying to look at the spatial information and see if uh, plants used space in a certain way to inhibit, um, inhibit the invader. So what we're looking at here is Eleocharis smallii. It's a very small wetland plant, um, is the blue. And you're looking at about a quarter of a square meter in area. There's about a thousand plants in this area. And the red is uh, Phragmites trying to invade year, year 30, 35, 40. Um, what she did was she looked at two different branching probabilities. So branching rate of 24% and branching rate of 10%. This is the kind of thing we can do in the model. We can just change the amount that the plants branch and you get the plants using space in a slightly different way, and how does that translate into uh, invasion? It's kind of a really interesting theoretical question. Unfortunately, we didn't get anything good enough to be publishable, but fun, kind of a fun thing to do. And I think it highlights how we've tried to design this model to be so broad with so many different parameters and so much in it that you could address a wide range of questions that we probably haven't even thought of. So uh, move on to talk about the biogeochemistry um, a little bit. Like I said, each of these grid cells in the model has a complete ecosystem model in it. So there's available, uh, this is nitrogen and phosphorus now, there's available nitrogen and phosphorus in the grid cell. They get taken up by the rhizome, translocated to the stem. Um, when senescence occurs, the, the plant stems fall and you have litter that mineralizes to uh, ammonium in the grid cell available nitrogen. It, it can also be immobilized and incorporated into muck. So you have muck formation in the model. Over time, the muck layer can aggrade um, and increase and it can alter the way that the hydroperiod interacts with the level of the muck. Um, there's pretty complex nitrogen cycling in the model as well, including nitrification and denitrification, just to say a few words about this. So, you have the plants and detritus, the detritus mineralizes ammonium. Ammonium also is flowing in and flowing out. And this little bow tie here just indicates that this outflow is governed by the flushing rate, the rate that the water is moving through this part of the wetland. Ammonium can be nitrified to nitrate. Nitrate and ammonium can both be taken up by plants. You also have nitrate inflow and nitrate outflow, again, mediated by the flushing rate. And the nitrate can be denitrified to N2 and N2O. Kind of an interesting um, thing can happen in the model called coupled nitrification, denitrification if the water level is fluctuating. And this is really interesting when, when you think about Great Lakes coastal wetlands because the water level is fluctuating. Um, so the water level, you know, can the muck can be inundated or the water level can go down and the muck is, is uh, aerobic, right? When the muck is aerobic, you'll have nitrification producing nitrate again, mediated by inflows and outflows, and then the water level goes up, the muck becomes inundated, and you can have denitrification. So if the water level is varying, you can have coupled nitrification, denitrification taking place in the same spot. And in the drivers in the model, we can vary how much ammonium is coming in and how much nitrate is coming in, and we can vary the flushing rate of the water, right? So we can explore all these different interactions in a, in a really sophisticated way. So uh, another model result here um, was an insight into the importance of water residence time. It turns out that residence time is super important in driving the biogeochemistry. I mean, we knew that, right? But uh, again, it's really kind of fun to see that happen in the model. When you have a longer water residence time, you have greater rates of nitrogen removal because of denitrification, okay? And again, especially if you have a fluctuating, uh, fluctuating water level. What you're looking at here is the residence time in days on the x-axis and, um, and removal on the y-axis, right? And you can see there's kind of a nonlinear interaction. As the residence time gets longer, you get more and more end removal. This also interacts with invasion because more nutrients means greater invasion, so another, another kind of interesting interaction. 
Another model result uh, is in C storage and sort of the aggregation of the um, of the mock and the litter layer, right? That, can, that level can change over time in the model. Um, nitrogen inflow on the x-axis increasing left to right. Again, each of these dots is a uh, is the end of a model run. Um, you can see the top line here when the muck is anaerobic, you get a lot more buildup of carbon. Uh, when the muck is aerobic, you get a lot less buildup of carbon. And when you have a fluctuating water table, it's uh, it's somewhere in between. So another interesting interaction between nitrogen inflow, carbon storage, and water level. Uh, I had a graduate student a few years ago, Ye Yuan, who wanted to study um, greenhouse gas emissions. So we so we added to this model the ability to do methane and uh, N2 and N2O um, uh, and calculate the global warming potential of these gases. So we have some, uh, some published results on this. Um, as nitrogen inflow goes up, methane production goes up um, through kind of a really interesting mechanism that I'll talk about in a second. Um, you also have net ecosystem exchange. This is, this is sort of a net, um, a net fixation of carbon, if you want to think of it that way. As the nitrogen flow goes up, you have a net fixation of carbon, which actually detracts from the global warming potential. So this purple line is the sum, the net um, global warming potential. It's really dominated by methane, and we found N2O, um, at least in the model, uh, had a very, very, very small contribution to, to global warming potential. The methane production, uh, there was a really interesting mechanism. I don't, we tried to see if this mechanism had been um, discussed in the literature. It may be, but we were not able to find this in the literature, but this is a really interesting sort of causal chain that's happening in the model. Water residence time and nitrogen flow control the nitrogen cycle. Uh, the nitrogen cycle controls the carbon cycle. As the carbon cycle ramps up, you get more, um, you know, more of this net fixation of carbon, the negative net ecosystem exchange, and you also get more methane emissions. And the the, the trade-off between those two is what gives you global warming potential. So it's this really kind of interesting mechanism where water residence time and nutrient inflows control uh, the global warming potential through the nitrogen cycle in a way that I'm, I'm not sure we appreciated before. Um, a really interesting model result. Show you another kind of interesting interesting model result. Um, we haven't been able to test test this in the field. It might be something interesting to try, but uh, at this point, just a model result. Um, what we're calling a regime shift. This is something that ecosystem ecologists talk about. Um, you could have something that happens in an ecosystem that shifts it into a new attractor basin or a new stable state, um, and we call it regime shift, and it doesn't go back. Right, so in this case, um, nitrogen inflows and a Phragmites invasion, um, you let the Phragmites stay there for 20 years or so, and then in the model, reduce the nitrogen inflows to a level where Phragmites can't invade, right? But it stays there. So this is, you kind of shifted the regime by having high nitrogen inflows long enough and having the invader long enough, you shifted the nutrient cycling regime. Phragmites traps nitrogen in the wetland and it accumulates in the in the muck and the litter, um, which is a good thing because then it doesn't get into Lake Erie, right? Because it's being trapped in the wetland, but it causes a regime shift in the wetland so that um, years later, even if you reduce nutrient inflows, you've still got uh, the invader. I only have a hand-drawn diagram on the phosphorus cycle because we just added this. Um, Took about two years to add it and two years to test it. Uh, those of you that are modelers probably know how that goes. When you get a model that's this complex, you're spending a lot of time testing testing the model, making sure it's working the way you think it's working. Um, but this is now fully tested and ready to go. And like I said, we're working on a couple of papers on this. We have phosphorus coming in as suspended sediment phosphorus or dissolved reactive phosphorus. Um, they can both flow out depending on the flushing rate of the water, the suspended sediment phosphorus can settle and become part of the uh, mineral soil sorbed inorganic phosphorus, um, which can then through sorption and desorption um, become part of this pool of dissolved reactive phosphorus that plants can take up. This phosphorus sorption, desorption, something we know happens in wetlands, really, really difficult to model um, in, in a model this, this complex. And what we're expecting is, one of the things we want to investigate is sort of legacy phosphorus. 
So af after a time, you have so much absorbed that even if you reduce the phosphorus inputs, um, now you're gonna have these options. So you're still gonna have a lot of phosphorus in the wetlands uh, for decades to come because of this uh, desorption. Um, this legacy phosphorus is something that we know happens in wetlands and, and we wanna be able to um, simulate that in the model. So um, let me move on to some uh, management applications, scaling up, and then uh, potential use in collaboration with Sigler. I put some time thinking into some things that we could potentially work on together, try to finish up in the next 10 minutes or so, and then take questions. So management applications, we had some funding from the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative to work with some managers in Saginaw Bay, uh, where we simulated what they should do. They went out and did it, and then we, we used remote sensing to look at the effectiveness um, and the idea was to sort of gather information from this um, um, to improve the model, but also to, to improve what managers can do and could they use this model as a management tool. So these are actual photos from our, from our work uh, to reduce Phragmites invasion. So the three, the three management techniques for invasive species typically used in the Great Lakes are fire, herbicide, and mowing. Um, so we added code in the model that can simulate each of these um, and one of the strengths of the model is that you can explore thousands of different scenarios. What if you herbicide on September 1st and then burn in October or, you know, herbicide on July 1st and burn the next April? What if you, is it better to burn one site every two years for 10 years or is it better to burn five sites one time, right? We can come up with all these different combinations. Managers really, really love this feature of the model because they could play with a lot of different things they were thinking about and just see what the model recommends. Um, doesn't mean it's right, but uh, managers love it because it gives you a reason to do one thing instead of the other, right? Or if, if it, there, there probably is some confirmation bias. If it shows that what you're already doing is, is likely to work well, they're like, wow, we love this model. <laughs> so I'm not gonna walk through this, uh, um, except just to say, these are the kinds of model results we get, we look at, the different letters here are control, burn, herbicide, mo, burn and herbicide, burn and mo, and so on. Increasing nitrogen inflows bottom to top, increasing years of treatment left to right, just to show that we can do lots and lots of different simulations and try to key on, key in on, okay, if, you're, if your test idea is five years later, you know, what's, what's the treatment now that five years later gives you the most natives uh, and, the, and the fewest invaders? We can simulate that. Like I said, we worked uh, to um, make recommendations to managers. We had to model specific sites, uh, which was a challenge in itself. Um, managers did the treatments, and then we worked with a woman at Michigan Tech Research Institute, Laura Chavez, who did remote sensing, where she can identify Phragmites and other species from space. And you can see pre-treatment, all this magenta is the Phragmites, and then post-treatment, you can see that it was removed. So we're sort of testing testing what the model predicted and, and also testing what the managers were doing. We had a workshop, um, a science team practitioner workshop, which was really a lot of fun because we ended up working, we had scientists and practitioners work together for three years. Um, at the end came together to just talk about, talk about this collaboration. Um, published one paper from this and working on another one. Everybody agreed that university science teams and managers, conservation professionals and planners need repeated engagement. Right, we were able to engage with one another repetitively over three years, and and you sort of build trust and build relationships. We all agreed that was really important, but um, unfortunately, it's often the first thing that's cut by uh, granting agencies. Right, if you put this in the proposal, they say, yeah, you don't need to do that. Um, managers need rapid use tools that can help with triage. If they just want, they have a limited amount of funds, they want to know where is it best for me to go um, implement some management a tool that helps you do that triage uh, is really valuable. Um, and the model results should be viewed as qualitative, not quantitative. This, this I think, if anyone who's a modeler knows this, you know, um, you're not predicting the exact outcome five years from now. You're saying, well, this treatment is likely to be better than that treatment. It's really qualitative. So I'll talk for a minute about scaling up. We're working on scaling to large watersheds and the, and the region, we're using AI to build a meta model of Mondrian, which is essentially a reduced set of equations that captures the full functionality of the model without having to run the whole model, um, focusing on key state variables. 
So for this project, this is being led by a colleague of mine, um, Kenneth Elgerma, Elgerma, who's at the University of Northern Iowa. Um, he did 140,000 Mondrian model runs in a systematic set where you vary the key drivers and you vary the parameters and you get this huge combined output data set. Then exploring various machine learning techniques to sort of learn the best set of equations to capture the full functionality in this, in this big data set without having to run the model. Right. Um, he tried a diff very different um, machine learning techniques, found uh, regression trees were the best approach. Um, and uh, one thing I want to caution is that this approach a whole is designed to fit in a particular hydrogeochemical model. The idea is you, now we can take these equations and plug them into a hydrogeochemical model that works on a really large watershed that you can model the entire region. But it's really designed for a specific hydrogeochemical model, something to emphasize. We're working with colleagues at MSU who have this um, landscape hydrology model. One thing um, we've not done, but that I would love to explore is scaling to the meso scale. Uh, sort of think about the one hectare to 10 hectare scale. You know, so Mondrian works on one square meter or less, right? Um, but every square meter is different in this wetland and they're all connected. So if you want to scale up to the meso scale, um, one way to do it is just, well, run the model numerous times to represent spatial heterogeneity in water flow, spatial heterogeneity in water depth and hydro period. We can do that now, right? And then just take the average. That's one way to scale up. But a little bit more sophisticated would be say, well, let's build an algorithm that can connect all those little one meter squared plots functionally with water and nutrients. So the nutrients coming from one side go to the next one and right coming out of that one, go to the next one. And uh, you could run the model or the meta model um, in each of these little one square meters. Uh, and you might have faster water flow down the main stem of the wetland and slower water flow in the side areas, right? That, that, I think this is an obvious thing to explore, to use this model to scale up, um, but something we have not done. Uh, and that brings me to sort of potential um, potential use by folks in Sigler or potential collaborations with Sigler. So this model is available open source. There's a hundred page user guide. You can go to my website and download it and have at it. Um, and like I said, we, we've designed it to, um, to be used to answer a variety of different questions. But I, I think part of our overarching philosophy has been, we could envision 25 research groups all over the world using this model to ask very different kinds of questions. And hopefully the model is robust enough to, to facilitate that. Um, but, there's a learning curve. It's going to require a time investment. It's not an easy model to run. I'm sorry to say. I'm happy to help and and uh, provide, you know, sort of consultation advice or or be involved as a um, uh, collaborator uh, to help people use this model. And the input files have default values for all the parameters. All those 250 plus parameters I talked about. The input files have default values. That's part of the set when you download the model. So you don't have to go out and uh, measure everything. Nitrogen and phosphorus interactions are new in the model because the phosphorus is new, it's fully tested, it's ready to go, but there's a whole lot that could be explored with nitrogen and phosphorus interactions that have not yet been explored in the model. Um, something I'd be interested in exploring is residence time distribution. Like I talked about in a, in a wetland like this, you know, you're gonna have different residence time in this part of the model, in this part of the wetland versus this part of the wetland. We know that residence time is so important. How does that distribution of re residence time affect um, what's happening in the model when you scale up. Um, changing water levels in the Great Lakes, I mean, we know that on decade to multi-decadal time scale, right, the lakes fluctuate by almost two meters, um, Michigan and Huron. Um, you're gonna get a different hydraulic head from, from one end of the wetland to the other as that water level, as a lake level fluctuates, you know, how does that affect residence time? How does that affect water depth? Um, this model could, could be really strong at try, trying to address those kinds of questions. Um, the meta model that I talked about to link to large scale hydrogeochemistry models um, could be another potential collaboration with Sigler. Um, and there's something I, I didn't have a chance to talk much about, but I just want to say a word about. We have this, something called the Setup Program that's funded by NASA right now, where we bring underrepresented minority students from Texas to the Great Lakes region each summer. So NASA funded us to use this model and to do some field work and to bring these under, underrepresented minority students. Um, to sort of help encourage them to go to graduate school um, in the earth sciences. 
right? The kinds of sciences that NASA funds. Uh, so they come, to, they come each summer. I have a colleague in Texas who organizes this. We have five or six students who come each summer. They spend some time at Michigan State. They spend some time at the University of Michigan. They work with me to learn a little about modeling and learn a little about remote sensing. They do some field work. Um, this kind of program, it's really a lot of fun. It's really successful. It's a great thing to do. And uh, I wonder if there could be, um, could be potential uh, collaboration with Sigler there as well. So this is my last slide. I'm going to finish with this. Um, I started with this overarching question. Um, can we understand and protect ecosystems and the functioning of the Earth system before we degrade it too much? And, um, and I talked a little bit about AI. And as Greg mentioned, I'm, I'm co-director of a AI and science program funded by Schmidt Futures. Um, so I want to just finish with a couple of words about, about artificial intelligence. Um, I think we're thinking too small, you know, using artificial intelligence. I know a lot of folks at Sigler are thinking are thinking about this. I know Greg's thinking about this. Um, I think what, what we're doing is we're saying, uh, oh, can I use AI to just take the questions I'm already addressing and, and work a little bit faster um, and a little bit better? Um, nothing wrong with that, but I think we're thinking, thinking too small. I think what we should really be thinking about is, oops, I don't know what I did. <laughs> Let's go back to these big questions and ask, can AI help us address these really big questions? And um, can we lay the foundation for that? And what does that look like? I think that's the way we should be thinking about AI. And uh, sorry, I just made this screen go blank at the very end, but uh, I'm going to stop there. Thanks. How do I get it back? Oh. I think we have to switch my uh, switch the screens here. Here we go. Okay, we do have time for some questions, so uh, feel free in the room to raise your hand. And and Margaret, are you able to monitor the online questions? Uh, yeah, online. Feel free to type your questions into the chat. Danny. Hey, hi, Bill. Uh, thanks for a great talk. Thanks. Could you say a little bit more about uh, how managers interact with your framework? I was kind of interested in how that actually happens, you know, because it sounds like uh, that's a really useful interface. Yeah. And I've, I've seen other sort of um, parameterized equation based approaches for projecting, say, future climate have like web interfaces where you can drag around parameters and experiment with it. So I was just wondering what, what that collaboration looked like on your end. Yeah, so like I said, we had funding from the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative to work with some managers in Saginaw Bay for three years who are actually managing for invasive species. Um, and we used the model to sort of advise them what to do, try a bunch of different things at different sites. They went out and implemented those. Then we used remote sensing to, um, to sort of um, learn what worked and what didn't, uh, both to test the management practices and to test the model. Um, we decided that training managers to use this model was probably not the right approach because it's just it's just complex enough and they don't have the bandwidth, they don't have the time to learn how to use the model effectively. So uh, we ran a meta model like like the one I, I talked about that we're using now. We're developing a meta model now to just develop a set of equations that represent the full functionality of the model that we can plug into a large scale hydrogeochemical model. We did this kind of on a smaller scale, a meta model. Um, that managers could use and we developed a web interface that's sort of a tool so a manager can pull up this tool and click on four different things what do you think the nitrogen inflow is at your site what do you think the propagule pressure is at your site that's the arrival of, of invasives uh what do you think the hydro period and the water regime looks like at your site and approximately where is it in the basin which we use just for for annual temperature um, so the manager would just go click on those four things and then it would magically show you what's likely to result from different types of management, herbicide, burning, mowing. And it just comes from this meta model that's sort of a distillation of the model functionality. They, they loved it, I have to say, just being able to sort of pull something up and plug some numbers in and get advice uh, was something that managers really, really appreciated. Um, 
Hi, Bill. Thanks for a great talk. So um, I'm very, very interested in uh, um, using your uh, modeling model and also the large scale hydro geochemical chemistry model. So can you explain a little more what's the main challenges combine these right. two approaches and also what's your perspectives? Thank you. Yeah, it's, I think it's a great thing to do to try to take so Montreal is, is really complex and it operates at one square meter to try to distill that down to a set of equations that can um, that can be plugged into a hydrogeochemical model. And AI is, I think, a really strong approach to try to do that. Like I said, regression trees have turned out to be the best so far, but there, there may be other approaches that, that can do that. Um, I think that I think it's a great thing to do. I think one of the biggest limitations is State variables are defined in different ways at different scales. And um, you have to have two people at least willing to put a lot of time and effort into this. You have to have one person using the hydrogeochemical model who's willing to put a lot of time and effort into, into this and one person who's very facile with the fine scale model who's willing to put a lot of time and effort into it because you're you're trying to come up with a set of equations that can get plugged into the coarser scale model. Well, it it defines things in a different way at different scales, and it takes a lot. Of, it takes a lot of work to do that in a sophisticated way. Does that make sense? So, like even even something like ammonium, you know, ammonium concentration in the water column. Um, well, Mondrian doesn't have concentration in milligrams per liter, it's grams per meter squared in the whole water column, and the hydrogeochemical model might have milligrams per liter, and it might be defined at a one hectare scale, and then Mondrian can't take what's in a one meter scale and use that at a one hectare scale. You have to figure out, how do we take that number and translate that to a, to a coarser scale, thinking about the heterogeneity involved? Um, it just takes people that are really willing to do that work, but it's a great idea. We do have one question online uh, from Bobby. Really fascinating talk. I apologize if I missed this because I came quite late. Is your model interfacing with the Fragmites adaptive management framework that USGS is leading? Uh, so Fragmites adaptive management framework, Kirk Kowalski, I believe leads that at USGS. Um, Kurt and I collaborate, uh, we talk to one another. Um, but there is not any link between the Fragmites Adaptive Management Framework and this model. You can think of them as really two completely different modeling approaches. Uh, because the model is so complex and a lot of, a few hundreds of variables. So when you run this model, how many variables you need to set up uh, uh, initial condition, yeah. then let it run for some time to reach the equilibrium. And then all the variables should be, uh, well, not all, major variables should be reach, uh, should reach the equilibrium. Or oh, what I mean is uh, this is, uh, system is uh, close, should be close. Otherwise, yeah. it will uh, well, run for a hundred years, it will blow out or you have to go down? Yeah, so it's an interesting question about running into equilibrium. That's a lot of ecosystem modeling does that. When we first started working with this model, we're not thinking that way. What we want to capture is the dynamics because wetlands are not in equilibrium. The water level is fluctuating. Nutrient inflows have ramped up over time. Invasives have arrived, right? There's not an equilibrium and we wanted to capture the dynamics. Um, however, to build the meta model, um, we run this model thousands and thousands of times and want to distill down to a set of equations that the main functionality. In that case, we are running it to equilibrium because adding a temporal component, we decided was just too difficult right now. It'd be great to do that in the future, but, but for now, we are running it to equilibrium. You know, I think it's probably 50 to 100 years it takes for this model to reach some kind of equilibrium. Um, and your other question was about. Um, how many drivers do you have to vary? How many initial conditions do you have to vary? It's really up to you as the user. You have to think about, you want a well-formulated research question. If that research question can be answered by just, just varying three drivers and three parameters, 
and that's all you need to vary. And you can use, use the default values for everything else. If you want to use the model in a way that's very site specific, then you need a lot more measurements and you need to vary a lot more initial conditions. Iran acrylic phylic model for 120 years project project the uh, ice and water into 2100. So I'm wondering that maybe the connection or collaboration between this between the uh, the phi acrylic and then the phi acrylic wetland uh, in the well. In yeah, I'm not sure how ice cover would enter in. I mean, ice cover on the west coast of Michigan is a disturbance to wetlands, right? Because the wind blows the ice into the wetlands. You could, we could simulate we could simulate that disturbance. Um, not sure how ice cover would would enter in otherwise. Hi, just. Uh... Kind of going back to the, the entry point of the kind of the relationship of the nitrogen inflow and the rate of invasion or the extent of the invasion, was there, um, I think you, you might have touched on kind of when we reduce that nitrogen level, um, has there been a lot of look into, does it go back, can, is the process reversed or, um, you know, if it's obviously a variable that's typically out of our control, but if we're able to cut off the nitrogen flow or reduce it significantly, do, do things kind of go back to how they were? Or or um, I'm just curious yeah. if there's been... No, things don't go back to how they were in the model. Um, I think it's really hard to get field data on that. And there are others in the room who know more about that than I do. But um, in the model, in the world of the model, so my son is a gamer and he taught me to, to to say it this way, they talk about in the world of the game. So I talk about in the world of the model, um, they don't go back because um, the wetland plants are um, capturing nutrients. The detritus as it's decomposing is, is capturing nutrients. The muck is capturing nutrients. So if nutrients are elevated over some, you know, historical equilibrium that may have existed 100 years ago, or 200 years ago, nutrients are elevated over that, you use that as your starting point, um, the, the nutrient retention increases the nutrient capital in the system over time, and it never goes back. There might be a disturbance that removed all the muck, you know, that brought it back, that could bring it back to some oligotrophic condition. Maybe a fire, if the water level is low and there's a really hot fire that burns all the muck, you could bring it back to some oligotrophic condition um, but it's not going to go back on its own. Does that answer the question? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. We are at time. I have a question online, and I think David has one too. Yeah, why don't we do one more question online? If, okay. Of course, if folks need to take off, please feel free. And David, maybe you can ask your question after, afterwards. All right, so thanks for the great talk. I am wondering what are the workloads of the model calibration in terms of time? Is there any auto, calibra auto calibration tool for this model? Yeah, that's a good question. No, there's no auto calibration tool for the model. There's definitely work involved. Um, you know, um, computer programmers have this phrase, garbage in, garbage out. Um, that certainly applies if you're um, if you're not thinking really carefully about the initial conditions and the drivers. Um, um, it's it's going to be really hard to interpret the results meaningfully. And if you just throw a bunch of parameters in and run the model, it's going to give you results, but it's going to be really hard to interpret those. Um, there, I think the way to use it is to um, have some have some dynamic situation that you think of uh, that I would call a reference mode that you think um, is either real or it's hypothetical, but it's it's a reference mode that you want to be able to produce first. You get the model to produce that reference mode for your system first, 
um, do whatever you need to do, whether it's calibration or, or, or playing with the parameters or whatever to, to achieve that reference mode, then make some change and measure the model output in the change against the reference mode. That's, I think that's really the way to approach this model. So you're looking at the difference between a change and the reference mode. And that reference mode might be something completely hypothetical, maybe an equilibrium that doesn't really exist, but you force it to exist by doing some kind of model calibration. Great, great question. And um, yeah, it's not easy. It's not the kind of thing a student's gonna do in a week just to put another figure in their thesis or something. It's gonna take somebody a year really working with this model to get something meaningful from it. Okay, well, thank you, Bill. Thank you all for coming and for attending online. We have a, a great lineup of uh, seminars coming up, including Sylvia Newell, who's here in the front row. So please keep your eye out for, for those. And let's thank Bill again for a great talk. Yeah, thanks. So, are we going yeah. to meet later today? And